Don't just accept for how things are, because if you truly want to make a difference for you personally, get 1% better every single day, as we talked about before, make a dent in the world, be better for your family, it is going to require change. It is going to require adaptation. And so this requires us to be very proactive in wanting to understand how to cope with change and how to adapt in this world, because I think we'll all be better off. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Welcome to the Dream Big and Think Different podcast, where we inspire, impact, and empower. Progress is impossible if you always do things the way you have always done things. It's time to dream big. Here's your host, Dr. Sachin Maskey. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dream Big and Think Different podcast where our mission is to inspire, impact, and empower millions of people. I'm your host, Dr. Sachin Maske, and we have today a very special guest uh, who is another dreamer, Dr. Gautam Gulati, or Dr. Z, has a very, very inspiring story that we all need to hear and learn from him. I'm very honored and privileged and very excited and thrilled to have him in our show, uh, Dr. Z, in our podcast show. How are you today? doing today? I'm great, Sachin. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I would like to definitely start with the Dr. Z uh, bio, as we are, as always do. And then we're going to start the questions. So in short, he's a doctor, fellow doctor, entrepreneur. He's award-winning producer, innovator, investor, professor, writer, and a health artist. The list goes on. Uh, in, as in, a, short, in short, I'm just a polymath. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or a multi-hyphenate, as people like to call it. Exactly. As, as you said just recently, he's a polymath doctor. Dr. Z has creatively blends his passion for health, innovation, and storytelling to create a positive impact. He speaks, writes, invests, advises, teaches, produces, and builds cool things, mostly in the health. Doc, Dr. Z is a currently a founder of The Wealth Home, and well played as over 20 years of hands-on experience as an award-winning innovation executive for a number of globally recognized brand and products, both inside and out of healthcare. He's a serial entrepreneur, advises, again, numerous companies, teaches the art of innovation at John Hopkins, Duke, Singularity Universities. He has been invited to deliver hundreds of keynote to help change the way leader things at Marriott, American Express, Merck, TEDx, and globally uh, recognized brands. Dr. Uh, Gulati brings 20 years of hands-on exp uh, innovation expertise, have delivered more than 300 talks over 30 global city, creating a positive impact of millions of people like you. Dr. Z received his MD and MPS from Jers Washington University uh, and MBA from John Hopkins University. He is currently certified as internal designer with a focus on wellness. He resides in Great Falls, Virginia. He enjoys uh, outdoor adventure with his wife, two children, and the dog. <laughs> um, welcome again. I'm, again, very excited today to have you in our show. Uh, how is everything down there in, in Virginia? Everything is great. Weather's starting to turn nicely. It's springtime over here. I don't know when this ultimately gets aired, but it's, uh, I don't know if you can see from behind me, but the sun is shining, and uh, yes. it, it's, uh, it's great. I love the springtime. Absolutely. So today's the topic I'm going to focus on um, uh, basically innovation, creativity, and health and wellness. I love what you have said in there. Uh, I was reading about you and basically what I like about your overall thesis is like health is a story over time, not a point in time. This is very, very, yeah. uh, very, very interesting. And we're going to dig more about it. Uh, my first question today uh, uh, for you is who is Gautam Gulati and why he is in this world? Who am I and why am I in this world? Well, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, we can probably unravel who I am over the course of this conversation and people can decide who they think I am. Um, but in my definition, you know, why am I sort of in this world? What's interesting is um, I, I tend to create occasional life mantras um, around, around things that guide my decisions and guide the things that I do. And one of them is, of course, just put good into the world and the, and the world would give, give good back. And so that's ultimately what I try to do across everything that I, that I get involved with, from my personal work to my professional life to the things I do in my, 
uh, you know, with my family and so forth. Um, and the other thing is this little motto uh, that I've developed a few years back when actually mm -hmm. a result of a, of a medical injury that I had, but I, I created something that was called Go Be Do. And Go okay. Be Do stands for go to interesting places, be with interesting people and do interesting things. And that yes. is essentially my North Star filter in terms of uh, the things that I choose to get involved with. And actually it helps me say no to the things that, um, you mm -hmm. know, I can filter out very easily. So um, that's, you know, what I'm about uh, in terms of, of how I um, decide my pursuits and, 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 and capitalize on opportunities. Um, but ultimately about me, I think you capitalized, you captured some things in my bio. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm, I'm a polymath. Um, and I firmly believe that, uh, you know, most of our value is derived from the intersection of how we apply thinking from different fields of industry. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, getting involved with different roles, getting involved in different industries has really given me a unique perspective in terms of how I view the world Absolutely. and how I can see what other people miss. And, and that's sort of been my core focus as an innovator over the course of my career. Absolutely. Very nice. So uh, I'm glad, uh, you know, we're able to hear their story and we're going to dig more into it. Uh, I want to go back uh, your childhood, you know, the way I do interviews, like want to make sure what your roots are and all that. So tell me more about what was your childhood dreams and how was your childhood upbringing and all that? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I've always wanted to be an architect when I was a, a child. Really? It's, it's funny. You know, when we, it, it's hard to, you know, as you're growing up mm -hmm. um, and your journey of adulthood, um, it's hard to understand where you're headed, right? And I think Steve Jobs in, in one of his speeches or commencement speeches said that you can only connect the dots looking backward. Yeah. Um, and luckily, I've had a lot of opportunities to sort of reflect and look back and understand, um, you know, where the, the threads really stitch together over the course of my life and over the course of my career. Um, and what's interesting is that I've, I've realized that I've always had a creative edge uh, from the very beginning. I'm... I'm um, the youngest of uh, a total of, of three of us, three siblings, two other cool. siblings, and three, including myself. I have two older sisters. So I've always grown up with sort of this empathetic side of me just because, um, you know, having two older sisters is really drives in that element of, of, of softness, but also at the same time, having creative li liberties, because as a, as the third and final child of my, my parents, mm -hmm. um, Oftentimes we become the, I don't want to say the ignored, but we get, we're given a lot more liberties as children and we're not, uh, you know, as, as, um, as, as focused on. And so, you know, we get to do things that are, that are probably not, um, you know, in line with what my eldest sibling probably would have had. But right. um, ultimately I have, I have, I'm a child of, of, of medical professionals. My okay. dad was an OBGYN. My mother was a microbiologist. Okay. Both my sisters are in the medical field and profession as well. One of them is a pediatrician. The other one is a dentist. Okay. And of course I fell in line as well. Not because I was forced to, because that's what I knew. Um, you know, we always talk about the, the immigrant, um, you know, pathway of either, you know, you're, you're, you're there a, a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I was never forced down the path, but it was always a, a space that intrigued me because I, I lived it and I, you know, I breathed it with going into my dad's office and understanding how he was impacting patients and, and transforming lives as a part of that. And I wanted to be a part of that entire experience. And so I became a doctor as a result of it, mm -hmm. um, but not because I had an absence of interest of other things. Uh -huh. um, and you'll start to see how, you know, my career unfolded in, in sort of a, a nonlinear way, just because I don't pursue degrees. I don't pursue, uh, you know, subjects. I pursue things that interest me and, and where I can make the biggest difference. And that sort of guided my way uh, over the course of my childhood, over the course of my academics and and of course my early career in adulthood okay sounds good so you were born here in the united states i was actually born born in uh, montreal canada okay okay yeah so my 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 parents had immigrated from india uh, -huh. uh just after they got married and my dad uh pursued a residency program and training at mcgill university in montreal Okay. And so me and both of my sisters, we were, all three of us were born in Montreal. Okay. Uh, but then when the separatist movement happened, uh, we were sort of, not, I don't want to say forced out, but they required everyone to be native French speaking um, mm -hmm. in order to continue to reside there. And so my dad could not speak it. He could understand French, um, but decided to move down to the Washington, D.C. area because he knew um, of some other friends who um, lived in this space. And so this is where I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area in Virginia. Oh, sure, sure. So it's been a while there, I guess, more than 20 years or 30 years. I'm not sure how many years you've been living there for. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I was I was only in Canada up until about four or five years old before moving here, and I'm 48 now. So you can okay, <laughs> wow, <laughs> time flies, man. <laughs> so I have a question for you. So the question is, I, I always wanted to hear from um, like people like yourself, you know, dreamers. Who and what inspires you and drives you to be productive every day? Uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's interesting that you asked me that question now, because for most of my um, career, I've always, I, I look to outside for inspiration, but I'm not competing with anybody except myself. Sure. And I, I feel like the root of unhappiness is when we start comparing ourselves or looking for influences externally. Um, and so for me, you know, there are sources of inspiration, um, you know, certainly in a variety of different fields, uh, depending on what I'm pursuing and working on. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I'm just competing with myself. And, you know, so I, I look to see, you know, I, I've got sort of this, this, this blog that I write a newsletter that, that tries to encourage just getting 1% better every single day. Absolutely. Um, and doing things and incorporating things into our lives, whether it be from a health perspective, a relationship perspective, from a career or productivity perspective, you know, there are different things that we can work on to improve. Absolutely. Um, you know, but I, I try not to get into the world of, of looking at external um, influences just because I feel like for me personally, uh, that has been root of unhappiness um, because we are, we're, we're in this constant world of trying to compare ourselves um, sure. to others. And, and I don't feel like that's healthy. I totally believe, you know, totally believe. I agree what you just said, one person better every day, you know, that's that's the way yeah. to go. I'm interested to know about your your journey from doctor, which I believe you're an internal medicine doctor. Um, you did a medical school. Oh. I, I, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and since oh. 1996 to 2000, you, you did a medical school. I have my school. feet on the desk. Okay, um, here we so go. So why, why did you <laughs> change from doctor, I mean, the regular medicine go. to... Um, to what you're doing now and how is your journey like, you know, and what are your struggles, you know? And the yeah, I don't, things. you know, it's, it's interesting. I don't, I don't think I chose anything. Um, I think everything else chooses me uh, when the time is right. And Absolutely. so, you know, I'm just very keen on being very self-aware in terms of my interests and, and mm -hmm. the pursuits and things that are really, I'm passionate about. Um, I'm still very much passionate about medicine. Um, I, I, you know, I, I was never looking to get out or escape medicine. I was okay. looking to essentially understand medicine uh, from a better and more diverse perspective. And so when I went through medical school, it was back in the day when you couldn't actually get dual degrees. And so I actually walked over to the business school and I said, listen, I, I want to do a combined MD MBA program. And they mm -hmm. looked at me with like, with confusion, like, why would any doctor want to get a business degree? Like, you know, that's the, the top as you can get. Like, and I was like, don't you understand? Like the future of healthcare is all, it's, it's a business. And, mm -hmm. and so we need to understand that element of things. So they said, well, why don't you walk over to the public health school and ask them and see if you can do a dual degree. And so I walked over there and, and um, I asked them, I said, listen, I'm interested in, in, in doing a combined MD and PH um, in health management. And they said, listen, if you can recruit seven other of your classmates, we can probably make the economics work, but here's a challenge. You're going to have to create the curriculum as you go. <laughs> um, and so we ended up, I mean, this is during second year of medical school, which as you know, is probably the worst time to be starting wow. anything different. Um, and so we developed the curriculum as we, as we went and created the, the, the dual degree MD and PH. Mm -hmm. And that basically just took me about six months extra, uh, to finish the MPH program after graduating medical school. And so that took me off tilt. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of applying for residency programs. And that's what sort of started the, the sort of meandering trajectory of the things that I pursued along my career. But I share that story because I think um, that really summarizes who I am. Um, if it doesn't exist, I will create it. Um, and if I believe that there's an opportunity in the future uh, for something like this, um, I will do my best to essentially make it happen. And so sort of that has sort of bled into everything that I've done. Um, and then following that, uh, mm -hmm. You know, you can imagine if you're finishing up medical school in 2000, yeah. this was the era of the internet heyday, right? I mean, Absolutely. everything exciting was happening. All these companies were being launched. <clears throat> um, you know, it's kind of like what we're seeing right now with AI really transforming the space. But at that time, the internet yep. was transforming medicine in ways that we hadn't seen before. And so I sort of got my feet wet with a number of different organizations and companies. Yep. Um, and the next thing you know, a few years passes. And I was like, listen, I need to go back and finish training. So I went back into training, um, but pretty much knowing that I was probably going to have a diversified career coming out. Sure, sure. So do you practice medicine at all or just went through the ventures? And I, I, I do not. I went through the training. 
uh, and then I came out. And at that time, having physicians who were diversified and understood the world of business yeah. um, and understood the world of, of population and public health and also had um, you know, operational experience in terms of, 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 of young companies, uh, you know, people like me were far and few between. So I was getting calls from industry mm -hmm. left and right. Um, to help consult or support or join these other organizations that were trying to essentially make an impact in healthcare. And so, okay. um, you know, I just pursued things that were of interest to me. And, and next thing you know, is, you know, I was, I was running my own, my own divisions and companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm very fascinated about what you have done. And I, I guess my, my thing is I've been practicing for almost 15 years in this country and then my mindset kind of shifted after I read the book from Mark, Dr. Mark Hyman, uh, the food. What the heck we should eat <laughs> so yeah. i lost 30 pounds myself after reading the book and um, yeah and my focus also is in, uh, similar like yours like wellness and i think we need to dive into what you're doing about well home and i wanted to hear more about it how do you get started what is your long-term goal on this well well thanks for asking i i think um you know for me i think any pursuit that i do has to be rooted in some sort of personal experience um or a service that i could have utilized myself Mm -hmm. um, now, I, when I was building and starting companies, the last company that we had sold that I was a part of, we'd sold in 2013. And I sort of vowed to myself that I wouldn't jump back into building a new venture unless it had true purpose and true meaning uh, in, in my life. And Absolutely. unfortunately, like any, like any, you know, company, major company, most of them start with a personal story. Mm -hmm. um, but let me start backwards first and explain what the well home is. And then I can share if you're interested sure. in, in terms of how it got the genesis of it. But uh, the well home very simply is interior design for people who are living with chronic health conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is something that I recognized uh, many years ago when in 2012, uh, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's mm. um, and he had a rare form called Lewy body dementia, which of course we didn't know until later, mm. um, but it was very rapidly progressive. And, and over the course of a couple of years, mm. it forced my parents to essentially move in with me and I and, and my family became the primary caretaker. Mm -hmm. um, and what was really uh, eye opening and apparent very quickly was despite getting him the best clinical care and medical treatment uh -huh. uh, that he could possibly get, of course, we're a family of doctors, we had the best uh, options available to him. Most of his quality of life and outcomes was really tethered to how he lived in our home and how he navigated our right. space. And so I started doing some research and I'm like, well, how do I know when to bring him to the main level? Are there things that we can do to adjust the lighting of his room to minimize the impact of sundowning uh, mm -hmm. or agitation? Um, are there things that we can create um, you know, a, a better social fabric to allow him to uh, be in conversation? Um, are there digital device trackers that we can use um, to track his movements and patterns. And if he were to fall, if we're not in the house or right. is he at flight risk? And, and so all of these questions, um, I couldn't find answers to. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I didn't do anything about it that time. It's still sort of the back of my head, but then, um, fast forward a couple of months and my mother-in-law, mm -hmm. uh, gets a stroke, uh, and, and oh, I'm no. out there helping them, you know, alter the, the course of their home to accommodate her, mm -hmm. um, health symptoms and condition. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a medical emergency while I was in a safari in Africa, which rendered me immobile for about three to six months. And oh. I had to sort of navigate my home with a physical uh, mobility issue at that time. I'm, I'm all better sure, now. Sure. But, um, and then COVID hits. And uh, all of a sudden, more and more people are spending their time in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw, you know, basically 10 years worth of innovation of, in, in digital health in the span of two years. Mm -hmm. really condensed to the span of two years. Yep. And I was getting asked a lot of questions from people who are struggling with the same things that I was with. Yep. How do I caretake for my parent with dementia? Or how do I, I've got these sleep issues. Do you recommend any devices or things that I could do? Or I've got these chronic migraines. And mm -hmm. so, you know, just like any other good idea, uh, I looked around and nobody was really solving for this issue. Right. Um, and so we decided to tackle it head first and, you know, sort of being, you know, a, a physician with also a real estate background. For those who don't know, I've been investing in and in, in managing real estate for the past you know, two to three decades as well. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, an interior designer. Um, it was sort of the perfect combination to be able to um, close and address this gap of where our healthcare system abandons us, right? So our Absolutely. healthcare, this goes back to that whole notion that you brought up earlier 
uh, in the interview where you talked about health is a story over time, not a point in time. Absolutely. And it's something that I've preached and talked about over and over again for years, because when we look at innovation, I don't know if you follow this blogger called Tim Urban, mm -hmm. um, but he writes this blog called Wait But Why. Mm -hmm. And in that blog, uh, in one of his posts, he talks about the 90 year calendar life in weeks. And so what he did is he created wow. a calendar, all boxes, <laughs> and every box represents one week of your life. Right. Now he, he, he developed it with the intention of basically saying, do something with your life. Because once you realize how many boxes are already filled in, you don't have that much life remaining, right? So it's, it's kind of a motivator. Time is limited. <laughs> right. But I looked at that graph and I said, huh, I wonder where we uh, engage with our healthcare system. And so I started coloring in some of those boxes with sort of red marks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, the, the obvious ones, you know, when you're born, of course, you're in the healthcare system often. Then they're sort of scattered on annual wellness checks. Then right. maybe midlife, you've got a couple of scares. And so you engage with the healthcare system. And then end of life, of course, if, you know, typically 70s, 80s, you're engaging with the healthcare system a lot. Right. And there was a lot of white space on this 90 year calendar life. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was that our innovation was only focused on those little red boxes where we engage with our healthcare system. Okay. But health just doesn't wait till you enter the system. Mm -hmm. Health is what happens to you in between. And that's where most of our healthcare system is not really addressing. It's, it's really the upstream factors. And that's why I say health is a story over time, not in point in time. Mm -hmm. And that's the well home. What the well home is trying to address is really that bulk that white space where we're spending most of our time inside of our homes and trying to address chronic conditions more upstream mm -hmm. by building in proper habits um, and design protocols that we can essentially um, incorporate into the designs of our homes for healthier living. Wow. Yeah, I mean, this is very fascinating. And I, I, I totally agree that you just said. And a lot of time when we see a doctor, when we get ill or whenever we do a regular checkup, we just go there probably once or twice a year, spend like 10 to 15 minutes of our time. And guess what? The rest of the time we're in home. 90% of the time, we do 90% of the time, we're actually indoor because of the you know COVID or whatever is the reason. But but people don't realize that the, the inside part of the home, day, you wake up in the morning, go to bed, and you're spending almost 80 to 90% of your time in home. And I really think that what you're doing is going to be amazing impact with the millions of people's lives. And I really appreciate what you do. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. We spend so much money and time. I mean, our biggest investment in our lives are typically our homes. And, absolutely. and uh, you know, where we, like you said, we spend most of the bulk of our time inside of our homes. Um, and increasingly so, we've got what, 60, I think 64% of the, po the adult population is living with at least one or more chronic conditions. Yeah. So this is a serious crisis absolutely. Um, that we have. And, you know, there are simple things that you can do to alter the, 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 the designs of your homes that create passive habits. Mm -hmm. You don't even realize that you're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's really important for us, and you're in real estate yourself, Yes, is to look at um, the, the space that we spend the most of our time with not just we, we've got green sustainability, we've got lead certification, but looking at things that essentially incorporate wellness into the natural fabric and the natural designs of how we live in our homes. And I think just some of those simple design changes can have you know, significant and lasting impact um, that have a trickle effect and a domino effect in terms of reducing chronic illnesses, reducing symptoms, reducing moments that we enter our healthcare system, and overall reducing the cost burden that chronic conditions are essentially having on our system in the, in the U.S. Sure, sure, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So what is the, what is the long term, uh, the goal of this uh, well home? Like, what are you guys currently actually doing, you know? A little bit more about well, we're, we're just getting started and, and getting off the ground now, but we're taking a little bit of a unique approach. And, and we just sure. announced uh, some interesting partnerships um, where we created a, thank you, we've created a proprietary um, uh, flagship product called the Healthy Home Inspection. Okay. So just like you would go and get a home inspection, we've created a healthy home inspection where we look at and evaluate your home through the lens of your specific condition. So you identify whether you're living with dementia, migraines, you have sleep issues, you have a child with autism, whatever it might be. Um, we then look at the, the snapshot of your home and give report and recommendation on whether we think it's a good fit and then things that you can you know, do to alter it um, to improve sure. some of your outcomes. But what we've done is we've partnered with local uh, real estate or regional real estate brokerage houses um, as sort of the gateway into the homes. And so sure. we just announced partnerships with TTR Sotheby's and also Douglas Elliman, which are two 
um, wow. you know, luxury residential Absolutely. brokerage houses. Um, and it's sort of a win-win for everybody in terms of how we, how we enter the home. Um, but that's a design services piece. And then of course, um, our customers uh, could essentially, if they, if they have the available funds, um, hire us to incorporate uh, and implement some of the design recommendations in the, in, inside their homes. Wow. Um, but then there's going to be a, a second component, which is a trade marketplace. We're actually building out the first trade marketplace in digital health and medical durable goods um, that we're going to provide discounted access to interior designers, architects, builders, um, as well as healthcare professionals. Okay. And then also through a membership program, offer that to our customers as well. And then the third piece is an actual uh, development piece. So we're mm -hmm. looking at right now we formed a committee. Uh, we're in the pro uh, process of forming uh, expert committees around understanding how we can take our, um, you know, the thinking that's been learned over the years around blue zone cities, yes. which are basically the, the I think they're called centurion cities yeah, where people more, live to more than hundred years old. Yeah. There's a book called right. blue zones actually. <laughs> yes. And, and so how do we essentially uh, uh, deploy some of that thinking into the, the the design of residential neighborhoods and communities wow. um, so that we can all focus on lifespan and health span. I don't want to just say longevity, but focusing on Absolutely. how do we live longer, healthier uh, for the most part. So right. I, I think it really starts health begins in the home. And right. so that's ultimately what we're trying to tackle with the well home. Wow, man, that's that's so fascinating and amazing project you're you're planning to do. And, and hopefully we can do something together and down in the road. I mean, in real estate that would too. Be great. Yes, you know, and yeah. uh, I like the the the, the whole healthy home inspection. Just a quick question on that: Is there any specific location right now you guys are focusing? Is going to be global or just United States? Yeah. So without revealing too much, right now we're just focusing on uh, the Washington D.C. area. Okay. Uh, and that's where our partnerships are formed. And the reason is, is because we are trying to ensure that we perfect the product and service that we're delivering to our customers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we're in sort of a learning feedback loop in the, in the current, uh, uh, our current iteration. Um, but as soon as we, um, as soon as we uh, finalize uh, the product and are happy with where it sits, uh, we're going to essentially expand it nationally as well. Sure, sure. So there's going to be, we look at it from sort of three different um, packages. One is a DIY, one is a DWY, mm -hmm. and the other is a DFY. The DIY, okay. of course, is do it yourself. So there'll be really the self-administered, uh, you know, automated report that you can get based on, um, you know, some of the um, images that you send and, and, and questionnaires that you complete. Mm -hmm. The DWY stands for do it with you. So it's a little bit of a hybrid approach right. where, you know, you could be geographically anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, do the self-administered questionnaire um, and, and take photos. And then we essentially follow up on a virtual uh, video call. Um, where we can then deliver uh, and discuss the report and, mm -hmm. and offer up recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, and then the DFY is you can probably, mm -hmm. you know, decipher what that stands for, do it for you. And yes. that's a full service in person, um, everything in person, a little bit of a higher tier uh, service model as well. So those are the three different ways that we're essentially deploying uh, the healthy home inspection, but currently we're just focused on the DWY and the DFY. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. And uh, I guess uh, any specific asset class, like single family, multifamily, any any other? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, predominantly we're working with single family homes right now, but also with multifamily. So if you're in a in a condo complex, we can come in there as well. Okay. Um, and it's really just that we just have a flat fee structure um, to conduct the analysis. Wow. Yeah, that sounds, sounds amazing, man. I'm really looking forward and excited to hear more about it in the future. Thank you. Sure. Next one, uh, another big thing you've been doing, uh, same uh, with related to the wellness. I think it's called Superhuman Podcast and Well Played uh, name, uh, Company. I just want to know why people need to listen to that and what is the mission of that? Yeah, well, I mean, Well Played was was founded accidentally. Um, I had a podcast over years ago, and then uh, right before, I think it was like 2018 or so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a, of course I'm a doctor, but I'm also you know pretty well networked in the in the space and, and a creative guy. Um, and so some of the executives of Spotify ultimately approached me and and, and a couple of my partners at that time wow. um, to explore what a health and wellness media channel would look like in the context of Spotify. And so mm -hmm. that really started us down this journey of exploring where the gaps in original content and programming are mm -hmm. in healthcare. And what we discovered was that there's um, a lot of boring <laughs> crap out there 
and healthcare. Yeah. And it really needed some, uh, you know, a different perspective and a different take on things. So our primary focus, we actually have a dual focus in, in the programming that we produce. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, um, we focus on utilizing story as a form of medicine. I love that. So how do we leverage it as a, as a way of healing? And so Superhumans was actually born out of that concept. Absolutely. Um, and then the other piece is how do we bring, how do we ensure that we bring truth to medicine? Uh -huh. And of course, this is now in an era of a lot of disinformation and misinformation uh -huh. um, in, in the world of healthcare. And so how do we become the anti-goop? Uh, <laughs> not to downplay certain brands, but how do we essentially ensure that we're delivering, you know, you know, scientifically based um, information out into the world? And so bringing truth to it. Wow. So this is uh, so. How does exactly like people will benefit? Like I'm just curious. Uh, do, do they buy something or like what they listen? Like what exactly this is? Yeah, no. So these are just you know we're, we we've developed a, an original content uh, studio just really to become an outlet for for ideas that are in our head. And this okay. really stems back to that question that you talked about as, as a you know who was I as a child? And I was a creative guy, right? So you know, absolutely. It, it just, it just happens to be that medicine sucks the creativity out of all of us, but it's still there somewhere if you can find it. Absolutely. Um, and so this was really my creative outlet. And so, you know, a lot of my speaking engagements, I give keynotes, okay. I use this platform as a tool to, to, to think differently in terms of how we can deliver it. Mm -hmm. um, but also with Superhumans, we just won several awards last year for um, our unique storytelling methodology. We have a very wow. signature methodology. As you can imagine, every show is about 30 minutes in length, uh -huh. but we actually record about anywhere between six and eight hours of tape oh, wow. to get to a 30 minute episode. So we've got this very unique methodology. Um, but ultimately when we started making it, um, we didn't know where it was going to go. And all we wanted to do was help individuals and use it as a, as a form of medicine, mm -hmm. as, as I mentioned. And what ended up happening after the first season is we were literally getting texts and emails from people saying how these, these shows and these episodes have saved their lives, literally saved their lives. Oh, wow. And so how do we not continue something like that? Right. And so, you know, we, we seek out grants and we seek out different funders uh, to support the programming. Mm -hmm. We're not advertising based. So we get sponsors and grants to essentially support our different creative endeavors and, and initiatives mm -hmm. um, across the well-played, across the well-played platform. Sure. So what people need to get advantage of this is going to just download this and Spotify and just listen to the story. Yeah. Yeah, just it's all, you know, the more people that listen to it, the better, of course, uh, it is for us to be able to obtain grants and sponsorships around the episodes. Um, but yeah, I mean, just go any any platform, Apple, Spotify, Google, uh, you can download it anywhere. Okay. Um, and take a look. Yeah, we just released a, uh, we're just in the midst of releasing a bonus season. Okay. Um, so we just launched one actually a couple of days ago, but you'll you'll start to see an unveiling sure. of more episodes. And ago. it's all free. There's no charge. There's no charge. Yeah, okay. there's no charge. Listen, guys, I mean, this is definitely we all need to hear. I'm going to download today and, and start following and, and listening and learn more about it. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, another question is uh, about um, innovations. That's your favorite topic, I guess. And I was actually listening to one of your YouTube video that you have done in 2015. I know there's a lot of things you talk about. But briefly, I just wanted to hear from you because this is your, your idea and also some principle that you can share with us about innovation. We are innovating now and what is next, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, innovation is a broad topic and of course it evolves over the course of time, right? right. Um, innovation to me ultimately is about, uh, you know, there's this, there's this, this saying in poetry, I used to be a creative writing major um, and mm -hmm. a poetry major. And, and they say that poetry is the uncommon arrangement of common words. Uh -huh. And I like to say that innovation is the uncommon arrangement of common ideas. Wow. <laughs> um, and so the, the, the question then becomes is how do you, how do you filter in and collect the right input of ideas to essentially create the uncommon arrangement. And that's why if you look at sort of my meandering career, right. and the reason why I sort of diversify in the people, the industries, the roles and the things that I do, because it gives me really that unique perspective um, of the world to innovate. Um, for me, um, you know, innovation is not a division. It's not a person. It's a mindset. Absolutely. And so a lot of what I talk about is how do we essentially uh, create and foster and, and, and create a culture of innovation inside of an organization, uh -huh. because the big, biggest hindrance isn't necessarily coming up with, with some of the best ideas. We can train people to do that. Um, the harder thing to train is get people to have an innovative mindset. And how do you incorporate that as part of a, a universal culture inside of organizations? Mm -hmm. um, and I like to talk about uh, this sort of cultural quagmire mm -hmm. uh, in innovation, which identifies sort of three, uh, three types of people 
mm -hmm. in organizations that a lot of people are probably familiar with. One is um, the chameleon, mm -hmm. the other is the ostrich, and the third <laughs> is the sea squirt. And let, and let me explain what each one of these are. Absolutely. Uh, we all know who the chameleon is inside of organizations, right? The chameleon is the person who basically tries to blend in. I know what's going on. I know we need to make change. Um, but, you know, I don't want to be the one necessarily guiding it. I'm just going to blend in and hopefully people don't notice, right? That's the chameleon. Right. Then you've got the ostrich who's aware of what's going on, but thinks that if they just put their head in the sand um, and, 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 and don't look up, that people won't notice that they're not a part of the conversation, right? We know those types of individuals yeah. in, in companies who try to avoid change and, and innovation. Um, and then the third one is what most people don't know much about. That's called the sea squirt. Uh -huh. So the sea squirt is this really interesting sea animal where its entire purpose in life is to basically find itself a shell. Uh -huh. um, and that shell is essentially its, its home that it's forever going to live in. Wow. But once it does that and it completes that task, it literally eats its own brain. Mm. Its job is done. And so we all know people in organizations who are sea squirts where they're really rigid and stuck in their strategy and they're, they're, they're unwilling to essentially adapt or flex. And of course, when the world changes, we have to have the ability to adapt and flex and, and be willing to um, question our own processes and our own strategies. And I think that's part of the hardest um, piece of, of, of any organization trying to drive innovation is when they're encountered with people who are sea squirts. Yeah, <laughs> I like the very, very nicely, you know, explained and really fascinating, like, you know, how we can, you know, the mindset is very, very important, as you said, you know, in innovation and, and how you adapt with, with the new technology and all that. So thank you. For I mean, as human beings, our natural yeah. psychology gravitates towards the average, right? We're, we gravitate towards mediocrity. Right. Uh, and not for any, you know, you know, malintent reason, but just, you know, we as human beings find safety in numbers, right? Absolutely. So we want to essentially do what everyone else is doing. And so we look at, we use terms like best practices and competition, but competition, as Peter Thiel always points out, is for losers. Mm -hmm. If you're essentially, you know, if your strategy is essentially to compete against your competitors, you're already in a losing game. Absolutely. The key is to essentially branch out. And how do you identify opportunities um, that are, are different and better than your competition, um, not necessarily mimicking your competition? Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, again, so uh, innovation, uh, another thing I learned today from you, uh, I mean, really, uh, I think you should put a little bit of word about this is design for simplicity and automa automated behaviors. And last one I like about is commit, then figure it out. <laughs> Those are two I really liked it. And if you can explain a little bit. Yeah, well, I think simplicity. It's funny. I actually have this um, this personal logo that, uh, let me see, do I have the hat? No, I don't have the hat on here. But um, I have it, the emblem and that logo on my hat, on a t-shirt. And it reminds me about uh, perspective and simplicity. And it's basically uh, Pablo Picasso's uh, bull lithograph who aren't familiar yeah. with it, where there's, you know, there's this really complex bull drawing on the upper left and this really simplistic version of the bull on the bottom right. And the idea of this philosophy is that if you ask anybody in the room, like, you know, that you're around to draw the complex one, let's say there's a hundred people in the room, you'd have a hundred different versions of that bull. Exactly. But if I asked everyone in a hundred person room to draw the bottom right one, which is a simplistic line drawing of it, which you can still tell that it's a bull you would probably have a lot of drawings that look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And the message about that is that, you know, is, is simplicity. It's a message of simplicity because that's essentially what gets adoption that drives behavior change. Um, it, it drives repetition. It's repeatable. It's reliable. All those different things that essentially that are, that are centered around human behavior and the science of human behavior mm -hmm. um, that allow us to essentially adopt products and the science of change. And so Apple actually incorporates that into the design of their products as well one behavior change at a time. Because if you try to do more than that and make it any more complex than that, our human brain doesn't know how to process it. Um, and so that's why you know I, I focus a lot on, on simplicity. I think it's an often overlooked thing. And, and the key question for a lot of organizations is how do you edit stuff out? Not add things in, not do feature creep or add more functionality or bells and whistles. How do you edit things out? Mm -hmm. Because that's the easiest and best way to essentially make um, and create change in an organization or for your customers. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so thanks for asking about that one. Yeah. Um, commit and figure it out, then figure it out. That wasn't actually I can't I can't take credit for, but it's actually inspired by my friend Mick Ebeling, mm -hmm. uh, who runs an organization called Not Impossible Labs. 
Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, he essentially uh, read an article. The backstory is he read an article about this kid in Sudan uh, when they were sort of in, in, in sort of a, a, a civil war. Mm-hmm. Um, and this kid named Daniel, uh, essentially, the, the town knows that when you hear um, aircraft flying overhead, that they're probably going to be dropping some sort of um, missiles or bombs in the area. Mm-hmm. And so when they heard the planes come through, uh, Daniel had uh, hid behind a tree and wrapped his arms around a tree, mm-hmm. the trunk of a tree. And when the bomb dropped, the tree saved him, his body, but his arms got ripped off oh, no. as part of the bomb. And so Mick Ebeling is this individual, just this hacker guy who lived in LA and read it in the paper, uh, you know, in, in the article where it quotes Daniel saying, I wish I had died in the process because now I'm a burden to everybody else around me because I can't do anything for myself. Mm-hmm. And so across the world here in Los Angeles, you know, Mick picks up this paper and says, you know, why is that the case? Like we have prosthetics, we can help out this kid. Like, why does he have to live this way? And so he basically uh, made a commitment to himself saying, um, I'm going to find a prosthetic that I can build for Daniel for under a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. And then called up the doctor and, and made that commitment. He goes, you know what, if I can, he goes, why don't you have anything for this kid? And the doctor's like, well, we can't afford it. Every prosthetic is, is expensive. They're hard to come by. So he made this commitment um, and then tried to figure it out after the fact, and he actually made it happen. And so about a year later, wow. he 3D printed this prosthetic, flew over uh, into the war-torn areas of Sudan, um, and actually got to witness and see Daniel smile for the first time and throw a football with these prosthetic wow. um, arm devices that he built for under $100. And it all stemmed from this notion of commit, then figure it out. Man, that's that's a very very inspiring story, and, and what I believe also my son. I, I don't know you, you heard my podcast. Whatever mind can conceive and believe, mind can achieve. You know, same thing, right? Yeah. So commit and figure it out. And really inspiring story, man. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah. uh, so a uh, couple of uh, more questions. We're towards the end of the show, but what is your dream now? I know you told two things, but anything else you're dreaming about? Wow. I mean, a lot of stuff right now is, um, you know, I've, I've got a personal mission where I'm trying to help make chronic disease optional wow. by applying the science of healthy design to our homes. Right. So that's that's my dream right now um, in terms of, of the work that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I, you just I mean, like everyone else to, to leave the world better off than, than it was when we first got it. Uh-huh. Um, and what are the small ways and little things that I can do to have a lasting impact? You know, I've got two children. Sure. Um, so much of what I do is I just want to look forward and in, in 20, 30 years, um, you know, if I look back and, and I want my children to be proud of the difference that we made and the work that, and the progress that we make and the things that we do and the people that we impact. Um, Absolutely. Legacy to me is, is not the things that we do in this world, um, but the impact that we leave behind us uh, for generations to come. Absolutely. Legacy is the key. So um, what is my next question? What, what is the biggest win in your life? And uh, how you define success? Success to me, well, I mean, the biggest win, I mean, I guess my children would be my biggest win. Um, and I, it seems like a very cliche uh, answer to give, um, but we also struggled with having children. So we, we had this notion of, you know, this world of, are we going to continue without children or, or not? I mean, we obviously have the, uh, the option to adopt, um, but our children are both IVF children. And, and so the struggles that we had to go through from a fertility perspective, we both mm-hmm. have what we just, what we call miracle children. Absolutely. So for me, that's my biggest win because it really is the biggest motivator for me mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the things that I do, how I live my life, the values that I present myself with. Um, you know, we live by the actions that we put into this world, not by the things that we say. Um, and so it forces me to live by the values that I preach to them. Um, because if we don't, it's just empty words. Um, so that's my biggest win, I'd probably say, because it really focused me to look internally. Uh-huh. Um, and that then has had an impact in everything else that I do, from the, the work that I do, my relationship with family, my relationship with friends, um, and everything else that really is is uh, sort of a, a tentacle from from all of those. Absolutely. Um, how do I define success? Um, success is, uh, I don't know, it's just it's just internal happiness, I think. Um, that to me is success. It's not about money. Um, it's not about even impact. I think it's at the end of the day, um, I guess you can look at success in different things internally and externally. Um, but internally for me, it's just about what are the things 
that make me happy. And again, if you, if you, it's, it sounds selfish to, to focus on the me, but if I don't, if I'm not in a good place mentally, um, then I won't be in a good place for other people. I won't show up for other people. I won't be good at my work. I won't be good for my colleagues. I won't be good for Absolutely. my family. Um, and so for me, success is finding that inner peace, um, that inner happiness, uh, that again, then has an impact ac across everything else that you do. And, 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 and it's a component of multiple things Like what makes you happy. I think that's very individualistic, right? So depending on where you are in life, uh, money might make you happy if you don't have any, if you do have money, then money's not going to make you happy. It's going to be something else. Um, so I think whatever those inputs are for happiness for that individual at that point in time is essentially going to be the driving forces for success. Sure, I absolutely, to totally agree with 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 uh, with your definition and with your perspective, and really appreciate uh, what you have shared. Um, believe it or not, we're towards the end of our show. <laughs> that, went, that, went, that went by really quickly. I almost want to I want to reverse this conversation and ask you some questions because you're 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 just if not more fascinating than I am in terms of your background. But uh, thank, thank you so you. much, Sachin. Thank you. Well, my last question again uh, today for yeah. sure, I would like to know where people can reach out to you. And, and what is the one thing you're going to share uh, to our audience if you leave? Wow. So the, the, the best place to find information on me is uh, personally, you can go to imdrg.com, I-A-M-D-R-G, mm -hmm. imdrg.com. Uh, that has everything about my background, my speaking engagements, things that I'm working on. Um, and also, if you're curious about The Well Home, you can go to uh, thewellhome.co.co. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're going to put um, all this bio down in the below. So Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, the one thing that I would advise people or, or sort of a recommendation for folks is, is don't, be, don't be scared of change. Mm -hmm. um, I think change is forward progress. And I think what oftentimes, you know, I, my nickname is the status quo agitator, if you look at sort of my speaking engagements. I and, love that. And so for me, um, you know, don't be complicit with the status quo. Um, don't just accept for how things are, because if you truly want to make a difference for you personally, get 1% better every single day, as we talked about before, make a dent in the world, be better for your family, it is going to require change. It is going to require adaptation. And we are natural, um, our natural, um, you know, behavioral, uh, you know, as humans, our behavioral psychology as humans is to resist change. And so this requires us to be very proactive in wanting to understand how to cope with change and how to adapt in this world, because I think we'll all be better off for it. Thank you. Thank you. It was really, truly really honor and really, really very good talking to you. I appreciate your time. And, and again, looking forward for future collaboration and meeting in person. And, and whoever is watching and listening to this podcast today, uh, please, uh, I will really appreciate if you can share with your family and friends and learn more about Dr. G work and, and be part of it, this big mission we have. Again, thank you very much and looking forward for another another show. Thank you, guys. Well, well thanks for having me, Sachin. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Dream Big and Think Different. We hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to subscribe to our show so you don't miss any gold nuggets. And we'd appreciate it if you could rate and leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, and other platforms. Until next time.